now recording sessions. <laughs> so I will put them on YouTube on our on our Huffmaker channel in the future. So if you are trying to take notes and you miss something or you're worried about that, you want to revisit this, then it, they will be there. I'll make them available and I'll announce it on Facebook when that happens. So and to, and also tell the Main Street Symphony for our Main Street Symphony friends. So um, I am quite an accomplished musician, but I'm a terrible technical person. So if we have technical difficulties, thank you for your patience. Thank you for bearing with me. I'll try and deal with glitches as I can. Um, and I'm gonna keep you all muted for now. If you have questions, throw them in the chat box and I will um, give them to Juan as I see them. So let's see, finally, last but not least, I have my little notes. So of course there's no charge for these sessions. We just want to inspire and motivate you. Um, if you do find yourself looking for an instrument or a bow or need a repair, maybe come thinking of us, think of us. But we also decided to do something kind of a little fun tonight with Juan because um, he does a lot of things besides just play the mess out of the violin. And so we're gonna do a thing where this class runs for eight weeks. In the next eight weeks, if you come in our shop and you say the magic word, the magic word is Juan Ramirez, then we're gonna make a donation to his nonprofit, the Atlanta Virtuosi Foundation. So we'll keep track of them. And then at the end of the eight weeks, we'll send them a check. So think about doing that just to help support the great work he does. Now, his bio, I put it on Facebook under the event tonight. It's like this long, but um, basically it reads like this. Won this award, won this award, won this award. Studied with this amazing person, this amazing person. Became an amazing violinist, played with the Atlanta Symphony forever. But I just wanna tell you from a personal experience what I know about Juan. Juan is probably the only person I ever met that has played in every aspect he possibly can. He's taught, he's played, he's donated his time, he's played at professional levels, he's played at community levels, he conducts, and he has never once that I've seen lost his unbelievably deep passion for music. You'll see it tonight, like he just loves music and loves teaching more than anything. So thank you for being here, Juan. I am gonna turn it over to you and I'm gonna spotlight you so everybody can see you. Um, it'll take me probably just a second to figure out how to do this. Ah, is that good? Now we have a star. So oh. there you go, Juan. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Anna, so much. And thank you to the maker, at least to make possible this um, session. And welcome everybody. And um, I know that um, when Anna spoke to me first, she wanted to know, a little bit more about um, the people that were coming and they wanted to learn more about how to play faster or what you said, um, fireworks for the left hand. But anyway, so this reminds me when I was a student at New England Conservatory in 1968, I used to go up upstairs where the, where the recordings were and I discovered this 78 vinyl recording of Haifas playing the last movie of the Mendelssohn and he had to play it so fast it's about a half not about a hundred a la breve and it's just you you should google that and just put um Mendelssohn Haifas or third movie and it's uh it's an old recording but it's still on and it's unbelievable how he plays so fast unbelievable so I don't know if we can beat him ever, but <laughs> but anyway, so the idea is to be able to to play. I have uh, I have two pages. We start with the first page. And hey Juan, yeah. can I interrupt you? Yeah. Can you turn your volume up at all? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I just, um, let me see here. Uh, yeah, I have all the way up. Oh. Okay. If you're all the way up and we'll turn all the way up, then we're good. Okay. Sorry, so sorry to interrupt. Keep going. Can you come close? Yeah. How's that? Beautiful. Better? Okay. So we can maybe look at the first page of the left hand techniques. There are only two pages, but we can. The first page is about the same thing. It's just that I had put the chart number one. Uh, in different strings. 
Uh, and what I'm trying to say with this is that just in one giving, no, that's Mendelssohn. Uh, the Which first, one are we doing? I'm sorry. Uh, the the orchestral studies, uh, when I have charts, there are seven charts, but this is left hand technique to Valin examples. So, example. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So you see in the first line, uh, we have a chromatic scale, but what I wanted to mention to the whole session is that the interval of the fourth, uh, this is the way I was taught, obviously, you know, other people may think differently, but the shape of the hand by fourths is very important to have our fingers always uh, curved and uh, to all the positions. So for instance, in the first, in the first line, we have an open G that I will start from the bracket from G sharp all the way to B. So we have, um, that's open G. So now from A, from the third bar, A to the fourth finger, okay? So, so I know you can see me, uh, maybe my left hand here. Can you see my left hand? It's too, it's below the screen, I think, one. The screen is small now. Yeah, turn a little bit more to your left. Your other left. That? No, like turn, pivot. Yeah, no, your other, your other left. No, we, I wanted to see my thumb. Yeah, there. But I mean, that's the, now we can see your hand. Okay. So, okay, so this all this round and not too much pressure on your left thumb. So you'll be able to have your fingers a little bit more closer to the string, but they will be, you'll be able to play much faster and more precisely. So like, etc. So this is the position of the forehand. So this is what I say about this chart from A to D, so the third, the third bar to the sixth bar. Okay, now, how many notes are they? One, two, three, four, five, six notes, correct? From A to D. They would have the chromatic scale between the second finger and the third finger. Now, we have an extension with the fourth finger. Okay, that's an extension. So that's an extra note that we can play. So, so far, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven notes. Now we have an extension in the first finger. So, so we have now already eight notes that we can play in one given position. Now, if we uh, consider the open strings and then we'll have nine notes, it doesn't matter what position you may be, you, you could be in third position. Okay, is everybody follows my thinking there? Can I interrupt you, Juan, and just ask everybody, can you see the orchestral study I put up? You can nod. Okay, great. Okay. We, I can't see Juan, though. You can't see Juan? No, I can just see the music and your screen, your computer screen. Oh. You have to turn the view to the grid and then um, um, go active speaking video, and then you will see um, the music. Um, okay, let me play with it for a second. You have, to, you have to, each individual has to push on the show active speaker video and then you can see him. All right, so what she's talking about is up in your far right hand corner, at least right. the, a lot of my things disappeared when I started um, sharing my screen. So that's why I'm a little, um, but up in the right hand corner where it says view. Yes. Is that where it can say active speaker so you can see him? Yeah, you have you have like um, 
my thumbnail, active speaker, um, thumbnail video, and you can have a grid. But click on the show active speaker video. It's the second little uh, blue square or rectangle. Oh, is that there? The microphone's here on top of the camera. Oh, I can't it's... figure this out. Oh. I think they and you, and then you can actually make that, um, when you have that, you can, in the right bottom corner, you can, if you click there, you can make it bigger or smaller. Hmm. I used to have a very larger picture. So maybe it was just put that page. So when I made him an active speaker, it didn't do it for all of y'all. It did it just for me. Right. Yeah, each individual has to do it. Okay. This is one of those glitches that I'm thanking you in advance for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> it takes it takes some fiddling around. <laughs> Okay, I put the instructions that we're talking about. Um, yeah, some people can see you great and some people can't. So um, if everyone will try that and holler at me if you have a uh, question about it or a problem and I'll keep trying to fix it. All right, Juan, carry on. So sorry. Okay. So what I was thinking is that once I finish with some of this, I'll be happy to hear any questions. So I. I will make sure that everybody follows what I'm, what I'm saying. You know, that's uh, I think that will be good. So there will be no. You can interrupt me anytime. No, it's no problem. Okay. So, but I was just thinking that in one given position, we can play eight notes, but followed by the perfect fourth, which is the first and the fourth finger are very important always through through all our playing. Uh, let me see if you can see me there. So we're uh, so. set it up. You see what I mean? The, is the moving the hand, moving the hand always together with the thumb is a perfect four. Now the notes between the chromatic notes that we have in the third bar, for instance, at the beginning, um, one, two, three, the four bar. So we have B flat, B natural. So we have four notes that are chromatic and those notes are very important because uh, of the, the way the harmonies are, the intervals. We'll talk a little bit more about that because that has to do with intonation and so on. But this, this is a, a string instruments. We have, we are very privileged that our instruments were not fretted during the Baroque time, after the Baroque time, after the viola de gamba and all that. And then we have more possibilities, especially for to interpret, to interpret in those semitones, so very close to or leading tones, etc. Something that we as string players, we are really affected all the time by the wind with the woodwind players and the brass that they all have the same intonation as the piano, which all the semitones are equal. So what is important when we play with piano, we have to tune with the piano as well. And we have that possibility through this chromat chromatism that we have. So for instance, if I have to play um, uh, anything that the Bruch Concerto, something that you are familiar with, so G minor. Um, that F sharp has to be close to the G because if I tune that F sharp to C major, see, it's flat. So I have to, by stylistically, I have to move my finger close to because it's part of the style of that music or romantic music. So, hey, Juan. Can you back up a little bit? We can't see your left hand. Beautiful. C 
see if I tune it with the D, it's going to be flat. So very close, very close to. So that's these are the chromatisms. All these notes that we as steam players have that opportunity of change the pitch to be able to interpret the style of the whatever style will be, you know. Um, anyway, so if you look at the first page and the bar eight, it's exactly the same thing. I just put all these notes so you understand uh, how you can do, you can transpose this to any any intervals you want to. For instance, in uh, bar 29, I have um, third, third position. So, so we have this. That's an extension. And then that becomes a fifth. Now, the position of the hand always has to be curved. If you can see my hand, all fingers are curved. I don't know if you can see the left hand, my thumb. There you are. Can you see me that there? Etc. You see what I mean? My hand moves by that perfect four. So if you can practice that perfect four, whatever position you may be, you will be able to, to understand the principles of intonation, but also the articulation and the mechanism of the left hand. So anybody has any questions before we go to page two? Bar 29 of the Mendelssohn, um, Karen Jennings was asking, is that what you were talking about? Well, I can do that. You can lift it up a little bit with the arrow is bar 36. Hold on, I'm getting there. Are you sorry? Are, we, are you are you still in the orchestral studies one? Yeah, but since you put the Mendelssohn, I was just going to give you an example exactly how the hand Great. has to be moved by fourths. Okay. You know, bar 36 right. is uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, yeah, excellent. You see what I mean? Bar 36, I have there D and A. That is the fourth. And sometimes it could be a diminished four, like in the in bar, um, I can see my bar 38. For instance, here you go. Set you see? Can you back up a little? There. So, okay. That is a, a diminished, a diminished fifth. Go then four. So. So Juan, so, can I ask a question? Yes. All right. So if my fingers don't move that fast, how can I make them move faster? I know that sounds really simplistic, but like when you do it, it just looks effortless. But when I do it, it's slower than that. Okay. So we can uh, usually in violin, maybe not so much in viola because viola has a little bit thicker strings and is larger for the intervals. But for the violin, usually it's reflexes. We, we play with reflexes. We, we cannot play it uh, contracted completely. We have to find a way to relax the finger. For instance, say, very light, very light. See? Are light you, fingers. Are you pushing down hard? Like, are you trying to hit it hard? Or are you just barely touching it? Oh, barely touching. So, etc. You see, much lighter. My, the fingers has to be really light, so the ball can compensate 
for the dynamic. Uh, so that's that's another aspect, but the technique of the ball. But I think that the lighter, the fingers. Of course, we can we have to practice slowly, uh, and then through all these things, I'm going to show you through the scales how how to play <clears throat> lightly and how to advance the fingers. Okay, so. If anybody has any questions on on this first page, which is pretty much about the same, I just transpose it to different uh, strings, and then bar 29 is third position, and also bar 36 is third position and the A. So. Extension. With four finger extension. So we have eight notes there, and if we use the open E, whatever to try to play other passages, we will have the possibility of having nine notes just in one given position. So if you can practice this exercise by repeating over and over um, any any place you want to. So. do any times here. This will strengthen your fingers in the position that I'm talking about. The fourth position plus the extension with the first finger, extension to the fourth finger to reach in intervals of fifths instead of the fourths. Okay, with the fourths is fifths and some could be diminished fifths or augmented fourths. Everybody understands sort of like I was, <laughs> I was taught by intervals, always, you know, and I know that sometimes in, in some of these schools, uh, even conservatories, don't, they don't teach them to listen to the music by intervals. And this is very important because all the composers since Vivaldi, is, they use the intervals, they use the scales, they use arpeggios, they use everything. So in music is just the scales and 12 notes so it's important to know if this is a minor second, a major second, et cetera, a minor third, major third. That's, this is the way my mind works all the time. Um, but anyway, so I'm open to any questions before we go to the second page of the same uh, examples. Um, I have another quick question, sorry. And all y'all can all jump in. Because <laughs> um, um, I know this isn't what we were originally talking about. When you talk about the intervals, so um, do you have any suggestions for someone to start learning their intervals if they don't have a music school background? Yes, well, we know that when we play chromatic scales, it's ascending and descending by minor seconds, by what they call it here, semitones. And I think in English it's called half tones. I never learned about this half tone or whole tone or whatever. I learned all this that is minor seconds. Chromatic scales is composed by minor seconds. So but so when I listen to the music, I oh that's better. When I listen to the music, so it's so all semitones now who have scales we know that is major and minor so that's one tone Man, semitone so i learned by intervals even if um you see like for instance um when i go and i play for instance uh mozart 40 40 symphony uh, and g minor so because I learned so fast when I was a kid. So my mind is, is the notes are exactly with my mind with so fast. So I could go mi re re, mi re re, mi re re, si, si la sol sol fa fa, mi re do do, re do re do do, re do do la, la sol fa fa, mi re 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 do do, etc. So, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's the way, but I know that 
in some conservatories, sometimes they don't teach solfege until maybe they do a master's degree or something, you know. But I think it's necessary to understand a little bit solfege, especially the do, re, fa, sol, si, do. In chromatic scales, we have do, do, re, mi, mi, fa, fa, sol, sol, la, si, si, do, si, si, la, sol, fa, mi, 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 do. So that's, uh, that's the way the European, the French school became from the 30s to all Latin America. And uh, they obviously we had European teachers, you know. My first teacher at the conservatory was from the uh, Santa Cecilia Academy in Rome. Um, Valente, he was Italian. And then my second, the second year I changed to, he changed me to another teacher that was assistant of Jacques Thibault. Vladimir Wolfman was came from Moscow and everything. He talked to me always in solfege. So that is the training that uh, solfege is very important because also has to do with the pitch, with the sound, the frequency that you will learn. Um, so I would say also that it's good practice uh, to when you are doing gardening or whatever you, whatever you're doing, just sing the A and check it out. If you are close to or you are too sharp, it's very important to have, to have that. I do that all the time, you know, all the time. It's, it's for training and for awareness of that. But anyway, so let's continue with this fourth position that is so important. I will show you um, in bar 42 is chart two. So Wait, by, Juan, I'm yeah. sorry. Tell me which piece of music you're on. Are you yeah, still on the Mendelssohn or are you on the- No, I'm not in the Mendelssohn now. I'm in the second page of the, the samples. Okay, the, I'm going the, back and forth because when I put up that, they can't see you very well. So, and if you'll back up a little bit more. You see? Gotcha, yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think I've got it up there. I just got to share you. Can everybody see his example? Nod. Yay, thank you. Yes, that awesome. that's good. So you see the first line, bar 42, says chart two. It's only for a um, uh, for few bars, uh, 43 and 44. So you can do that exercise. Um, see, by force and every string, you can go to third position if you want to one four. So you can keep your hand curved. You see, the only thing I move is my very important this. You got to move this, and we will be talking about the position of your arm as far as intonation is concerned. Um, because when we always were thought at the beginning, uh, G, D, A, E, etc. You know, like these degrees, but there are more degrees, there are degrees between the strings. So we need to know exactly what it is. And when you, the way, the way to know about it that you are in the right position because we all are different. We all have different hands, shapes and fingers, long and some short. But the most important thing is when, when, the, when the note is perfectly in tune, that is your right position. See, if you remember that, you will always be in tune or understand that you are not in tune. But anyway, eventually you'll fix it. So I. I think this is very important for this. I cannot play the same example in the same position. Look at what has happened. Oh. You see, it's out of tune. My four finger is out of tune because I'm not, so I have to. Uh, now. See, I have to move my, my hand at this cane, but later on gets a little bit more complex and the elbow in your arm is the one that it has to, to move. You can just try, for instance, one note, 
let's say I will play A in the G string. Now, do I like this sound? Do I like this sound? No, because it's not, it's not centered, even though I'm in the right position in the right pitch, but the sound is not centered. So I have to move. You see, now it becomes clear because my hand is in the right position. So the intonation is perfect. My position is correct. Now, if I go to the left, see, it's going to be flat. So I get there. So by moving your elbow, you'll find out the perfect intonation, and that is the right position for you. Any questions so far? I think we're good. I can't see everybody. So if you have a question, um, shoot it in the chat bar or else do that little wavy thing. Karen Peters is giving you a thumbs up, so she's good. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So what I was saying, the arm, so. I cannot play in the same position the next you see it's not come it's not in tune because my arm my I have to move this so all the time to have the right position so let's say um if I could do B natural in the E string, I get to find the right sound. No, that's not good. No, I send it more there. And then it becomes when the note when you hear that your note is actually centered in tune, that is the right position for you. That's that is always. I tell all my students, that's it. You have to move your elbow and find out the perfect pitch that has to be centered. Because then so, if you, yeah. So you're talking about muscle memory, basically. Like memorizing where your elbow is and your muscles are and your arm is. Right, and you can do it slowly. Always do, and you, your mind takes a little bit longer. Do it slowly. And then once the muscle has the memory, that's it, you know? Because there are cases where there are cases where some people don't practice for a week, but if they have done it well before, they have the great memory and the muscle has the right memory, there's no problem. It's a matter of half an hour to warm up and that's it. And um, you know, this this is always I did an experiment after this pandemic when it started. I didn't practice for three weeks. Yes, I say I'm gonna not practice for three weeks and see what happens. So, you know, it took me five minutes to warm up and I was fine. So is, is, the, is the memory, the mass, once you have the memory, it's like anything else. You know, I think that when I look at these guys playing basketball and they really make the basket, it's all memory. You know, it's action, action, physical and all that situation, but it's, it's memory, it's act. And uh, that's exactly the same thing in, in, in Aristomus. But anyway, so let's continue. So, because we need to get to other things also as much um, to, the real, to the real things later on. So we, in bar 45, then you have another example there with chart three that is still the chromatic, the fingers chromatic. You can practice. You can practice, you can practice like this with that sound. Uh, let me see if you can see me better. I go. So. Light finger, so you can be able to start speeding from a slow tempo to faster tempo. And then you can play it. So, but start slowly and you can practice always with, without the ball. So, 
etc. Okay, always see fingers always curve. You see my thumb is curved. I don't know. Um, I don't want to mention anything negative about anybody, but I have seen some people playing with the thumb. Uh, let me see. You can see my thumb like that. The thumb should be a little bit curved and not. Sometimes I practice without the thumb. So. To get to get used to that, my thumb should not be really hooked to that to the to the fingerboard, because since I have to play many positions so fast, so the thumb has to be free to change Back position. Back up, Juan. Back yeah. up a little for us. There, yeah. great. So the, thumb, the thumb has to be free always. When you change positions, like for instance here, the Mendelssohn that before. So that first note to change shifting, which we'll talk a little about shifting, cannot be contracted because if it's contracted, you are frost. There's no way to play. So, so, see? Lift the finger, nobody's going to hear that but you'll be able to change the position without, without having uh, musically okay, but it will be no problem. So, so, et cetera. So this is what we talk about shifting later on and chart, uh, in chart five, the position of the chart five is the chromatic scales is exactly to do what we do in shifting. And there are many, um, let me see, there are many, um, when it comes to shifting, we have so many, many types of shifting, many changes of shifting, but the principle is the same. So we, we can use the chromatic scale to show you that the, when the finger, the finger that you are departing from to cannot be contracted. It has to be relaxed to have a really nice shifting and to be able to move with agility. So we have bar 50. So, so practice this. Leave the finger. Leave the finger, even it sounds right now, not so nice, but uh, so, let me see. From here, I cannot go contracted. Leave, leave the finger, leave, leave the finger. Leave. So it, it can move faster. That is agility. You'll be able to play any cheap thing that you will do, but the finger that you are departing from before you get to the next finger must be uh, relaxed here. So let's see. So you, you will hear that and you'll be able to, like for instance, you have, so we get, um, I cannot play this contracted. I have to relax. So. So when you have big intervals of shifting, there is something that I want you to be aware that the bow is slows down. So Juan, before you get to the bow, Karen Jennings was asking, is she supposed to lift the finger or not? Is yes, it uh, not, not, not off, just on the string, not to, lose, not to lose the touch of the string. 
is that you would play a harmonic. You see what I mean? Lo. See, when I play harmonics, my finger is relaxed completely. This is relaxed. So same thing. So I have, for instance, uh, see, I cannot be relaxed. You see, already I didn't lift it, but I did that so you can know that my finger, you see, will be a little bit that way. So, 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 before the E and the A, I must relax that finger in order to make to the A it really nice and smooth and I don't get tired. So relaxation always is a point of reference to all the music. You have to find a way to relax. I learned this long, long, long time ago. So I could survive playing a symphony orchestra now for at least here for 48 years. <laughs> but before <laughs> I play orchestra since I was 14. So there is always a way to relax and every, we will talk about this later on and how to advance the fingers through the scales and how to relax and how to play successfully scales and so on. So anyway, so anybody has any question? Um, we will talk about chart number six bar 52 that will be is advancing advancing the fingers and and the scales in this case but it could be a passage it could be anything we need to find a way to advance the fingers for instance um let me see if i have this uh, Okay, so let's say advancing the fingers in this chart is, is we have a simple scale, G major, but it can be done in any scale. So, then already my first finger is an advance with the fourth finger. I'm sorry, can you back up and explain that again? So, with your 24 finger, with the first finger. So, etc. You see what I mean? So, that is already advancing as many fingers as possible. And also, also think about this finger is the leader most of the time. This is my finger, you see, it's a little bit curved. I don't know if you can see it before. <laughs> because it's, it's the position, you know, it's, it's, it's the leader all the time of the first finger, all the time. Sometimes we other fingers that are leadership depends on the, the how complex the music could be, you know, Bartok or uh, Alban Berg or all the composers. But in the classical thing from Beethoven, Mozart, Brahms is always, advance these fingers always is the is the leader is the so you have to find which finger should you stay always so because we only have four fingers so we don't have to use it all the time one two three four one two three four or four or two three one we just have to push that finger there and maneuver it with the other things because we are going to come back to this finger or to that note with this finger so um so this is the way to do it. Now, for this, for instance, I'll give you an example. Uh, let me see if I can play them. So this is uh, what uh, Orum by Mender, by Vivaldi. So, so you don't have that example there, but I'm going to show you the. So you have the advance of the film. So here again, you have the 
You see, the, here's, the, here's the position of the four. And by this means that you have, you have a four interval Now, you have an octave, you have fifth. So, I showed you that chart before. You see that? That's exactly the same position. That's the way my hand will, uh, we will practice that passage. So I don't miss. Mm -hmm. Relax, relax. So always find a way to relax in difficult passages or even in simple passages. Always, there is a way that your hand, your fingers have to relax so you keep moving with the same energy. Any questions so far? Um, and then I will go to chart seven, which is very important. Chart seven is the, the first position on the violin, which is the most complex one. Uh, the, other, the other positions. Once you go to second position, everything is the same all the way until the ninth or 11th position, or nine positions, they say. We usually use nine positions, you know. Um, but so if you have that chart, it's bar 60, is the last one, is the last. Is the last uh, stuff there. So that's what I was talking about. A to D, you have a perfect four. A to E, you have a perfect fifth. A to A, you have an octave. Okay? So that's what is important. So fourth. <laughs> You have octave. So the second, the second and third finger are chromatic. Again, we go back to the same thing as the beginning. Then you have extension, etc. So this is the idea of the position. Now, when we are and um, charge, charge seven is G major, okay? So I will just play one scale, one octave scale to show you that the G major, we have one, two, three, four, and five different degrees in the first position. This is what is so difficult when you try to <coughs> teach a child. It's so difficult because the hand is so far in the fingerboard that the connection is, is more difficult. The third position becomes more closer because you are, you, you are here, it's easier. But first position, the arm is already extended for a child, it's difficult to understand all that. But, and for us also, we need to understand that G major is the first degree, so. <laughs> See what my thumb is? No. Now, I would play A flat major in the same position. Look at what's happening. See what I mean? My hand is contrived and it's not in tune. So I have to go a degree lower, almost like a, in English they say half position, I guess. That's what they do. I'm trying to learn this terminology in English because everything was. For me, it was entirely different, you know. So, so, so it's like for me, like I tell my wife, um, she is in sixth grade, so she knows how old she may be, but I don't know. I can, you know what I mean? It's, it's, anyway, so here we go. Mm. Now, A flat. Is it? I cannot play G major in that position. I cannot play that because it's not precise. I had to move there. Now, that's G. A flat. Now, A major, 
I cannot play a major in that position. I have to go another step. I have octaves. Now B flat cannot be in the same position. See what I mean? It doesn't sound good. So now B flat is a bit towards the towards the pegs. A little bit. Then again from G. A flat. A natural. B flat low. Higher. Etc. Once you get to second position, C the same. The same fingerings goes up and down the same fingerings from C major, second position to third position, chromatic and all the way to ninth position, same fingerings, same fingerings. And it's uh, something that <clears throat> we learn through all the music, you know, just like show you this uh, position. Uh, No, here. So my elbow has to move to get the right intonation, the right pitch to be centered. So not only, not only the fingers make, has to be fast and uh, flexible, but we need to be centered, always centered with round fingers. If you try to always play especially your thumb, you see, our thumb was made that way. It was not made that way, but obviously if we can try to, it's the same thing with the bow arm, the thumb is also round. It's very important, you know? I mean, there are many positions of the finger, blah, 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 but the thumb, the thumb has to be really very, very important, you know, right there. So I don't know if you can see it. Like that, okay? Not like that. Not like that. Because people that play like this, if I play like this, the sound is not good. You see what I mean? It doesn't sound good. It sounds like a mariachi. Okay, so anyway, so I hope you understand the, the first positions, um, the degrees of the first position. Anybody has any question? No, but Juan Ramon said to tell you that he was sorry he had to drop off and he says hello from Ecuador. Oh my goodness. <laughs> he was here for a while. Well, that was two, uh, they are two hours behind us, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he has a concert to go or something. I don't know. Anyway, so that's good. Um, now, there are so many, so many degrees of the scales to the chart, that's chart seven, when we go into the scales and there are many scales of course that you can study, but we have just majorly minor, melodic and harmonic, but also we have um, augmented or diminished scales. We have whole tone scales. We have, uh, but the becomes a fifth, um, uh, that's Bartok, etc. So we have all these scales and um, through Bartok and many other composers from the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I just want to let you know that the uh, from the second finger, the second finger uh, is very important from second position all the way to the ninth position. So you go. So. So in my thumb. Now here we have a problem because, because this part, there is no hole here to be able to go there. So we need to somehow get around that by like this, but still our fingers are curved. 
So, that's the position of the, if you practice the scales by that, I know there are many, many techniques on the scales. You have the flesh scales, you have uh, the Russian school scales, all kinds of things. But uh, these fingerings, starting from the second finger from this second position all the way to ninth position, they were done uh, by, by Enesco, Jacques Thibault, that was the French school from the 30s that uh, they established the certain fingerings to do the scales and minor scales, you know. All right, Juan. So yeah. Kimberly Collar is asking if she wants to make sure, are you starting all of those scales on the second finger? Yes, from C, from C major. Gotcha. Yeah, all the time, so C major, so. <laughs> Juan, can you tell us what is that fingering slowly? So like on a C major scale, you start with a two. What is the fingering for the scale? Okay, so it stays on. Now here. With what finger? Okay. But on that first octave, two, three. Oh. It stays there. It stays there. If you want to go three octaves, I go. E with it. So it's the same, the same fingerings up and down. You know, it's the same fingerings. Um, so let's do again. So here. So. Extension, three, three, stay there. All these fingerings like this are all the way to ninth position. So Juan, do you have a scale book that you suggest or do you have like these fingerings somewhere where somebody can find them? Yeah, I mean, uh, I have written some of these scales um, and the other, the, the left hand techniques that um, that I wanted to talk a little bit about it. Um, and this, this, uh, this little book that I had, um, I did it for this class for how to have agility in the fingers. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, um, practice very slowly, so. Without pressure and not too much sound. Set it up. So all this uh, just, and you can practice with no sound also. Make sure that you are in tune to that your change is correct. So. <laughs> all this by fourths. Okay, here's my question. So you're going one, four, one, four. Your second and third fingers, are they staying off the string or are yes. they going down with the four? No, they 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 stay off of the string. They're hovering, okay. Yeah, so. See, I don't move it, they stay there. They stay in the same position. So I only concentrate on that first and fourth finger to, to do it now. And then and the next thing I'll do, preparing for the trills. For very slowly, you can practice. Um, So when you trill there, make sure that the, the finger is in the same place, same place, same direction, same direction, okay? So you can do these exercises. Um, I notated all these exercises, so because repetition is good in this case, repetition all the way through. And I made it to maybe just 
I think that was two. I don't think I got, I was only first position. So, and all the way through, then, then we have to practice scales, uh, just one octave, uh, no open strings to, to talk about advancing for the fingers we talked before. So, so, so. Slowly practice, but then start speeding up, speeding up. So your fingers can start moving more ligero, less, less, more contact. Now, when we play scales up, we have an advantage that because of the gravity. So we don't, we don't have to, we don't have to push it. So no, we have to push it, but coming down, yes. So go. We have to do that. Otherwise, otherwise, see what I mean, it does, it's not articulated. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very important when we come down, when we come down, what is important to do, uh, articulation, the fingers, and the fingers have to be lifted as much as possible, faster, but not too far. So, let me see, let me see, see better. So, so, important of the elbow, let me see, so. See so the elbow is very important to rotate that because it helps you in always advancing the finger and relaxing the finger, especially if you, um, when you are shifting. Okay, so that's, uh, these exercises, they go all the way to nine position. Um, then, in the other part of this thing, I have combinations of fingerings. For instance, we have one, two, three, four, three, two, one. So, one, two, three, four, three, two, That's one combination of fingers that is going to be used a lot, you know, uh, and then goes chromatically. Again, with the fourth note, the fourth interval. So. Those are another one combination of fingers. The other combination is, is backwards. So we have uh, uh, so now, all by four. Etc. So the same, keeping the same structure or your four. Always keeping that position and we talked at the beginning, the importance of keeping your fingers curved. The only interval that is not curved is the extension, the B flat from the E, E by fifths. And then, for instance, like. See? This is curved. This is not curved. Not, not completely flat, but that's the way we play the, the, the diminished fifths. Now, the fifths, like this. Same thing, the, now, cool fingers in the perfect form. Et cetera, well, for the extensions, you know? 
And also when you play, I wanted to let you know that when you play these extensions, uh, it's better to extend it and to learn the position from your four fingers, not to the first, because you you see what's happened with the first, I'm locked, you see? So I cannot go higher. It's already, my hand already hurts by going to that. But if I change to that note, the position higher, I can go higher because I'm not, I'm not liked. So always, sometimes we have to think backwards when it comes to specific passages, you know, and the, and the music. Um, anyway, I know that uh, sometimes it's difficult with, without putting those examples, but I just want you to, to learn about the positions of the finger. Now, the other combination is one, two, three, one. Set it so, and then try this with accent. Accent in this finger, so we learn to do accents. Sometimes we have to have accents in, in the music. For instance, this part. So I have to find what note I can lean it and to have a little accent. So that one. So that's easy then. So once once I have the concept of the accent and how to move the shifting. So now the shifting is very important because that is so fast. So, you see? Can you relax back the, up? Relax the finger. Yeah. So. Then my hand has to have accents in my mind and my hand. It's low. You see? Mm -hmm. So, set that. This is it. <laughs> any questions? Am I, am I talking only to you and I don't see anybody? I see everybody. I, th I see people smiling and people nodding. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, Kimberly Collar says, Finger patterns lead to sev check for a lot of people. Would you talk about how you use or don't use sev check? Well, I know that we uh, study all that chapter, but there are so many books. Who wants to buy all these books? You know what I mean? Like, I love to buy books. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need a bigger house now. But anyway, so no, the idea is that is uh, because these pedagogues, they really went into so many combinations of fingerings and all this is very good. But, you know, there was another um, teacher also that we did master classes in, in Boston University. Uh, last name is Dunas. So Dunas uh, had these very difficult exercises for cellists and violists and violinists. And most of these people, they got, they got, they got hurt. They got arthritis. They got, you know. So we need to. The idea, whatever fingering you do or exercises, you have to find a way to relax. I cannot play a major scale without relaxing each finger. You see what I mean? I have to relax. So. So. to change so here so I have to relax every time I shift every time you have to find a way to relax 
again, same example. We'll go back to, uh, we need to find always in music, what Mozart said that the silences are as important as the notes and sometimes more important. But only he was talking about not is to relax. The music has to have silence to relax. And then at the same time, he was talking about just, he didn't write it this, but we understand symbolically what he means. So, so mm, I'm going to try to the, it's not good. So, mm, relax. Again, relax. See, we have to find always not only in the left hand, but also in your right hand. So you can survive many conductors. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's the idea. But um, but there are many exercises in this little book that I put there. I have several combinations that you can practice for, uh, for the left hand technique and how to achieve its positions and relaxation of the fingers and all that. This is very important. It's like, I think the most important for us to, when we play is how we have to play a passage that is difficult, but then we need to relax between that and then between the passages and within the passages. Uh, for instance, I say that example in the Vivaldi. So, See, I'm going to try this. Here is again the same thing that Vivaldi used that example as the scales that I'm telling you. Second finger. So. So. Same, it's the same mechanism. So it's not that I invented these scales, it's that these guys, pedagogues, they figure it out, all the passages that are in music from the Baroque to the classical, that there is a sequence, uh, a sequence of notes that has to be written down by specific fingers. So we don't have to, so we can utilize our raw fingers as much as possible. So always trying to find, I don't know, um, for instance, a lot of people saw here, um, see, so Don Juan, so, accent here, I cannot be in the same position. You see what I mean? My E is not going to be exact. So, so, I advance my elbow. Is that there? So, So where articulation is good. So you have to find always relax here. Relax. 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 Always find a way to relax in music. So you know, so you can last for a long time practicing and it still gives your hand, your hand that is flexible and is not tired. One exercise you can do is to strengthen your fingers and your tendon is to go down, down like this. Just press all the way up and relax. Like that. Yeah. And another exercise that you can do is right hand also, you can hold it like this, hold your hand and round it. Press, press here. So, so press here, this, and then go backwards. Then go up and down as much as you can, but always relax it after, relax after, then go down, relax. So this, do this every day. When you get up in the morning, do it in bed. <laughs> I just wait to my wife to leave the bed so I can do the results. <laughs> no, but you can do them any time. Same thing with this. Same thing with the right hand. 
always. And um, this, uh, this is precise was showing to me with one of the medical doctors that take care of hands and all that, because we worry all the time about our hands. Always our hands has to be really in good shape to, to be effective playing, you know. Anyway, so any, any questions you may have? So Juan, so we only have 10 minutes left. Um, I put in the chat box, um, Juan has sent me an email for anyone that's interested in getting his book that he made, his book of left-hand techniques. I did put in there, um, and you can talk about this a little bit more. It's a digital copy and um, you can email him. I've got his email address in the chat box. If for some reason you're off tomorrow or away from a computer or whatever, and you can't access that, you can email us at the violin shop or put it on Facebook for us and I'll send it straight to him. I'll just forward it to him. So, um, so and it tells you how you can pay him and all that kind of stuff. Hey Juan, is this address down here your home address? The yeah. Virtuosi Foundation. So if we want a toilet paper your house for Halloween, that's the one we would do. <laughs> just wondering. <laughs> I mean, I mean at the lake, maybe. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'd like to know if anyone has any questions. Would you like to like unmute and actually speak for yourself? Um, I cannot hold on a second. Let me move this so I can. Da, da, da. So if you do raise your hand, mostly I just see people smiling. Well, I will, I hope that this being helpful somehow. I know it's difficult sometimes not to behave one by one, but you know, I think that something I'm sure will be sticking out there and uh, hopefully that you can practice and um, just remember your elbow, your hands, everything. Hey Juan, yeah. Kimberly has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you so much. I noticed when you did your trill practice yeah. that you had uh, the another finger down other than the two that were involved. Thank in you. The trill. Thank you. you I forgot to tell you. Yes. I forgot to tell you. You always try to find uh, something to lean. Okay. Another finger. So go. That would be you third finger. Up? Third finger. Now for second one. Now one. All fingers down for the fourth, because the fourth we have only one tendon here. So this is how Schumann screwed out his thumb. I mean, his, his pinky, because he wanted to make it independent. So he tied it to the, his finger to the wall and he broke it. So. So we need to have all the fingers down for, to straighten that fourth finger, especially the third. Closer, closer, much closer. Now there's another thing that I want you to talk about position of the finger. What would be the first position for any finger? So mm, A, I have to find, no, not good. There, you see how the sound is clear. Mm -hmm. So all these sounds uh, has to do with that. Now for play Tchaikovsky, fat fingers, like, like Ostrak, you know, not like a stir, but like Ostrak because is um, it's a beautiful sound. So keep um, pointing. So when you go up. Especially if you play Mozart, point fingers. So. Now, if I play that passage with flat fingers, you see that difference? Point fingers. So it's clear, very clear. So 
you have a chance to fool around with your fingers. What, according to what? The style of the music or whatever, you know? Mozart always with point fingers. So always point fingers, you see? Point finger, no. Point finger for clarity of sound. That's what Mozart is so important to understand this. Vivaldi, Mozart, Haydn, all this uh, is, is very important to understand the position of the fingers. So any questions? Yeah, Donna wanted to know if you have any tips on coordinating your fingers and your bow on separate bows on fast passages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was going to show you, uh, let me see. Well, this one, uh, this passage that they have in the symphony of Mozart is, uh, you need a lot of articulation. Let me see. So, so you know this bar. That's that beautiful symphony have there. So there is a passage. So that's a very difficult fast passage that comes. So same thing light fingers and the bow has to be divided in half notes. One, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, so. Here with spiccato, you have to save your bow so you are right on the part of the spiccato. So I'll go again, so. So I'm right there. So I don't have to have an extra motion to get back to the point of the spiccato. So that's that's one example. The other example, uh, let me see. Um, famous passages on the Leonor Overture. I think I sent you that, but so advancing the fingerings. Okay, that's, yeah, that one. So the Leonor Overture, you know, it's, that's a tricky passages and uh, hoping that the conductors don't take it so fast because it doesn't make any sense. You know? <laughs> so they all the time, they see presto, they think it's running. No, so uh, the thing uh, is to first of all, advance the finger. The first two note is a fifth. So, so that one. Etc. So advancing the finger. So etc. So advancing the finger, but also it is the technique of the bow. We have four strings, so we have to get closer to the string, and this is the same principle as I told you about the scales. The, see, I'm gonna, you see what I mean? A circle, get it closer. So get closer, same thing here. Mm. Get closer, no. No way. So we have to use this rotation. This is what we say, we always circles. So we need to continue being circles, always in the right hand. But this is another session on the ball. Uh, the ball is the most complex and uh, playing faster, the fine, but the ball is, a, is another technique. It's, it's a beautiful technique. So I want to let you know that about the ball, if you want to continue, there are so many things, the Italians, during the time of Vivaldi, they invented what they call the 
the the the eight you know the eight they they draw it like an eight here mm -hmm. to go up and then down i'm exaggerating there but um if you do they do um like what would be a good example um but well, anyway so there were so you so, so you don't you don't hear the change of the ball so you don't hear the change of the ball, but it's no reason. The best thing is to practice the scales by slow down the ball, so you don't hear. That's what you need to listen to Maestro sharing. He he told me that. So here, so um, yes. slow down, slow down the ball, and then at the same time you slow down. You relaxing the tension that you have. So not. No, not not to the sound will die if you stop the ball. In the practice one four. So set it all this goes three, four, one, two, three, four. Slow down, slow down, and then speed. It's like cruise control, same thing. Okay, think about what happened to cruise control. It's exactly the same technique. Or oh, think about the pendulum. I'll let you know about the pendulum. So there are two theories of the pendulum. Some scientists say that the pendulum, before it comes back, well, it has to come back faster because of the gravity to put time, you know? But they say that the pendulum stops. So they must rely on the weight of the pendulum to come back and the gravity. But the other theory is that the pendulum before, let's say this is A, this is B, A and B. A to B, the ball that does not stop, slows down and comes back, slows down and comes back. That's the same principle not to have anticipation of the sound. So, mm, slow down. So it's, the sound is precise in your down bow and your up bow. But you can do that as slowly in, in the scales. Slow Re Relax, relax. Continue. So, so you, do, you don't have anticipation of the sound. If you hear even greatest violinists today, concert artists, most of them anticipate the sound because of this. It's, it's, the, it's one of the hardest thing and the string instrument. Cellists, they do even something even more drastic. They go, you see that? You look at the cellists, they're kicking this. I call it the hiccups. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right, Juan, so let, we're going to need to wrap this up. And I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, so if do you take private students if anyone or do coachings online if anyone wants to contact you for a coaching in person? Right. You know, uh, as I was telling you that the symphony now did something with GMEA and uh, I received instructions and I would not see the students and I, I would not hear the students play. So how can I how can I correct them? Well, but I'm assuming like if any of these, if our attendees tonight, if they wanted a one on one with you, they yeah. would turn on their camera and their, and then it would you could see them. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that now since I'm installed already here with this. Uh, yeah. Uh, so his again, his email is on the chat box, and you can certainly again contact if you lose that or something, you can shoot it to us, and we will send it to him. Um, so why I want to thank you. That was awesome. I learned a lot. I think you're amazing, and. Um, we will talk to Juan if this session, if this eight week class goes really well, which I see no reason why it wouldn't, we're gonna do another series in January and February. And so mom and dad are cheering for you. Oh, thank you, good to see you. So, um, I do wanna tell you all next week, um, Sarah Na Caps is gonna be here. She's an amazing cellist. If you've ever gone to hear the Johns Creek Symphony and heard a stunning cello solo, 
it was probably her. And um, she's gonna talk about getting the richest, chocolatiest sound out of your instrument possible. And it doesn't matter if you're a violinist or a bassist, although we know the cellist is the most gorgeous sound. Just kidding. So, um, <laughs> and Juan, I have one more thing to say to you. Yeah. This is so unfair because I'm really a bass player. And do you know what we have under our hand? One what? whole step, that's it. I know, so there are more chances to play out of tune, but uh, no. Oh, okay, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> no, but listen, I, I always, the bass is the most important frequency when you play in an orchestra, a string quartet, cello, the bass line, because if the bass line is not focused, when you are high position, you are not going to be exactly you are not going to sound that good because it's affected by that, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very interesting, you know, it's very interesting, but I think because of the harmonies, everything has to do with harmonics, but that's what cellists and bass players, they have to practice and practice and practice, you know? But uh, you know, when I play in, uh, in Boston, when I was a student, I play in the ballet, in the opera, and the ballet always a nutcracker, which I was, was great for me, because I get a lot of money to get to Mexico. That, you know, around that period of time, we play 18, 18 times the Nutcracker, you know, I was so sick after that, you know? But anyway, so I was thinking, oh, it's in my airplane ticket, you know? So um, uh, Arthur Fiedler used to conduct, and he used to say, because that was his birthday there in one of those days in December, and he was to gramble all the time, he used to come, and I'm sure he was already drinking scotch, but he said, he's a, uh, Every time I come here, I'm I'm, I'm getting closer to my to my to my dad. You know what I mean? And <laughs> it's one more. He says one more year less. Then he said, without even getting to the podium, without even tuning the orchestra, he looked at the bass players and said, "You guys, you know, the only thing you do is." <clears throat> I mean. <laughs> Every summer, so I can never, I can never forget that, you know. But you know, some of these guys are really, really crazy, you know. Anyway, so, anyway, so have a good Thanksgiving if I don't see you, obviously. Um, and uh, but we are going to go to the lake because every time over here in this house where I live, very close to spaghetti, yes, uh, few more blacks are there. There are a lot of a lot of Mexican kids. And they don't belong to this neighborhood, but they come in trucks and they come like 10 of them, 15 of them. And I say, do you live here? No, not really. I said, well. <laughs> but you give out good candy. That's well, where the best trick or treating is. I know, but well, maybe I should do something like one of my neighbors that he's no longer alive, but he used to give him an apple and the kids, they hate it. <laughs> give him an apple. And Probably. that's how you're gonna get your house toilet papered. I'm just saying. <laughs> Okay, well, it was great to see you. I didn't see everybody, but I hope you really got something out of the, me and uh, my thinking and hope, hoping that we'll be able to continue this later on. Thank you so much, Juan. And yes, to the people who ask next week, bring your own chocolate. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to end the meeting. Y'all all have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.